Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Newspeak, the New Culture Forum's weekly current affairs programme. I'm your host, Emma Webb, and this week, as usual, we're joined by senior fellow and cultural historian Philip Kisseli, historian and senior fellow Rafe Hadel Mancou, and the director and founder of the New Culture Forum, Peter Whittle. Yeah. This week, we're going to be talking about the latest census results that have been much anticipated. We've spoken about them a lot on this show, guessing what they might be. Um, what's been going on with Albanian Independence Day and disruption in London, and um, also the closing of a collection, uh, the Welcome Collection at a museum uh, here in London. So let's begin first by talking about the census. So there's a lot we can talk about there. Mm -hmm. um, just to give a few statistics, the, the one that really leapt out at me, and this I find actually quite deeply upsetting, um, is that less than half of the population overall now um, identifies Christian. Those who say they have no religion has risen, um, and yeah, the, every every other religion other than Christianity um, has has risen. Christianity has fallen in this country. Yes, isn't it something like? Uh it's a huge amount, something like eight, either 8% eight or 8 million or something. Mm -hmm. More people now. 12% decline in Christianity. So it's down, it's down from 59.3% um, of the population to 46.2%. It's mm -hmm. quite a huge drop. Yes, it is. In just 10 years. In just 10 years. And in fact, if you look back to 2001, it's remarkable, the, mm. the drop. It's sort of, you know, there are a whole number of different reasons for this, I, I, I think. But what's interesting, first of all, is the way in which the media has led on this. Mm -hmm. um, and you could say, well, of course, it is a big story. But they have tended to go on to, uh, on to this story, this part of the census, rather than the huge demographic change in mm -hmm. cities that I'm sure we're going to discuss. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it's very interesting, I, uh, you know, because you see, in the kind of political world, or at least in the world in which we um, inhabit, um, religion plays a disproportionate part. When I say that, I don't mean we're all devout, but it's a very much a, a, a question of it being discussed. Mm. It's present. Mm. I suppose for most people, it's not. Um, I think the huge damage was done during the pandemic when the churches more or less just didn't even attempt to give any pastoral mm -hmm. mm. uh, guidance to people. But I think there's the other thing, and it, it's, you know, it's just purely my, uh, my view on this, is that this this kind of decline started when we started to get a far greater um, presence from Islam. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's almost like people saying, well, you know, we've got to get our own house in order before we criticize other religions, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, you know Islam has actually had the largest increase. And all yeah. the religions yes, have increased, it's sort but it's of had almost the largest like increase. Somehow if we stop believing this, then they'll stop believing that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's this extraordinary kind of logic of mm -hmm. kind of liberal mind. Mm -hmm. And I think that plays a part. And also there's been a great encouragement, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if we are generally, or many people are shedding our, trying to shed our foundations, so one of them that's going to go is Christianity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And actually, the the, the re reaction from the bishops, and particularly the Bishop of York and the Church mm. of England, it's clergy to this, has been, as you would expect, totally relaxed. They just expected it would happen, and they they seem to be completely fine with the fact that their church is dying at such a historically dramatic rate. Yeah. Well, you never hear them. Sorry, but you never hear them really <coughs> complaining about the lack of people going to church on Sundays. I mean, other people complain. Mm. We discuss it. Have but you ever heard any of them I say, think, we've think, got to arrest this? I don't think they feel that they have any authority to mm -hmm. tell anybody anything. They're mm -hmm. just trying to secularise the church in the hope that people will come in and ha they'll get bums on seats. But actually, the opposite is true. That's not what people want. It's almost so the, much wrong. It's but. almost the way, isn't it, when the church starts, you know, uh, playing rock music and, and guitar mm -hmm. music. It's, it's precisely what people don't want in, 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 an, in, a, in an attempt to... Uh, appeal to young people. I think I think the Islam thing is is, is really interesting. So uh, that's gone up, I think, from four point five to six point seven. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a massive jump. Mm. Bearing in mind the general narrative is one of us becoming a secular society. Mm -hmm. So that really pushes back against the broader grand narrative. That that's one thing. I think the other thing is we've got to ask ourselves: Are we happier? as a secular mm. society and my god we're not are we are we are we coherent as a secular society do we have a set of um 
ethics and morals which, which work better? And, and, and the answer is, on every level, no, I would say. And Rafe, this is a real problem for the Constitution, isn't it? Because the, 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 the establishment of the church, the monarchy, um, all of these things are Christian in their origins. And so if we have the humanists now yeah. coming, a humanist organisation now coming out and saying, that our society is not religious anymore and in fact has one of the largest irreligious populations in Europe, that none of these Christian aspects of our constitutional framework make any sense. So this would could potentially lead to, in our lifetime, a radical overhaul of what Britain even looks like in its material fabric that is has so such ancient roots. Yes, I think in the secularized society in which we live, people actually don't appreciate exactly how deeply Christianity runs through the constitution, through the fabric of this country. It's fund founded fundamentally. We still have an established church, right? Just the very presence of an established church is a complete anomaly, really, in global terms, where the, 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 our sovereign is the only one that's actually crowned and has a divine element to it, as opposed to the European monarchs who aren't crowned, and there is no sense of a religious covenant between God and the peoples. And also, we're the only legislature, uh, apart from Iran, that has clerics in the upper house, in, in, in the chamber, which is an interesting contrast. It's it? an interesting uh, contrast. <laughs> so yes, the church is in, in, intimately entwined into the, and of course, the prime minister appoints bishops too, right? Mm -hmm. Involved, well, recommends appointments of bishops, I should say, on that level. I mean, the interesting thing about the census results, of course, is that this is much more a story of secularization than the rise of Islam and so forth, if you look at the percentages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, the Catholic Church isn't doing badly. The Catholic Church is thriving. The Orthodox Church, because of all the Romanians who are coming over, is doing very well. The Evangelical Christian Churches, because of the Africans and the South Americans, are doing very well. It's the C of E that's the problem yeah. here. Yeah. And why is, why, why is that, that, that anomaly? It's because the other faiths and the other de denominations are offering concrete beliefs yeah. and principles that stand for something. Mm -hmm. And people need to have things that they can actually cleave to at this time, whereas the Church of England is trying to be all things to everybody, and it's neglecting its core base, who actually want some of that sa same, mm. not necessarily fire and brimstone, but want some of that same strict ideology, and they're going after, a, a, they're on a fool's errand, going after parts of the population that have never had any interest in joining the church. I think, I think one of the interesting things there is, is as, as you say, Rafe, and I think that's absolutely true, that immigration doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a, a, a fall in religious beliefs, quite, quite the reverse. Uh, but I think what's happening is it's almost like a Kierkegaardian revolution, isn't it, where the, uh, where the institutions are absolutely stripped of any kind of, uh, any kind of religious element whatsoever in terms of what you've just said mm -hmm. as Britishness and the Constitution. Well, and as you say, the Church hasn't really been that concerned about the census findings, and we've just also heard that the Crown Prosecution Service has said that parts of the mm. Bible cannot yeah. be read out in public yes. because they are unsuitable for today's era. Mm. I don't recall hearing that much of a complaint about this from members of the Church of England, from the bishops, mm. who are very happy to lecture mm. about just of oils, uh, the, the merits in, in their protests. You know why that and then is when it comes to the faith of their own faith, that they're supposed to def you know, defender of the faith. Mm. <laughs> That's because they never talk about the uncomfortable parts of the Bible. The, 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 bi the, the senior clergy in the Church of England barely ever talk about sin, mm. so they're probably not worried about any they, they're probably not really even particularly interested in the Bible anymore. If, if their reaction to the census is anything to go by, they're not actually very con concerned mm. with trying to bring in the souls of the nation. They're just happy to let their flock run off and get lost. What would this uh, Crown Prosecution Service say, therefore, about the Quran? Mm. Mm. Well, exactly. This is dead silence. Dead silence. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's just an extraordinary desire to wipe out. Mm. Um, you know, any hollow out, mm. you know, uh, all of our It's, a, it's impossible <coughs> to imagine the CPS saying this about any other mm. religious text it's, apart from the Bible. It's interesting that they feel they can attack Christianity probably because they feel that Christianity is their own. Mm. But actually, if you look at the census results, given that society is now largely um, atheistic mm. um, or at least largely not Christian, Christianity is now a minority belief in this mm. country. Mm they're not attacking their own they're actually attacking um, a minority that belongs to a religion that is actually persecuted worldwide well no but you see that's a, it's a minority that is in their view okay to attack mm. um, I remember when we did an event quite some time ago now about the persecution of Christians around the world um, you know it was um, discussed as why the BBC particularly didn't really highlight this much mm. and um, what became obviously apparent was that it's because kind of Christianity in the world 
you know, is seen as sort of an oppressor religion, in, if, you're, if you're using their terms mm -hmm. of reference, uh, oppressor white religion. So they don't care about it, mm -hmm. you know. Whereas all these other religions are, um, you know, they're basically untouched simply mm -hmm. because they are minority religions mm -hmm. and they are from the victimized. Well, I don't know where that leaves Buddhism particularly, but I mean, mm -hmm. generally that is, <laughs> I think, that that's the dynamic going on. I mean, but there's just one thing to add to that, isn't there? And um, we're talking about Christianity specifically here. And you don't have to be a, a, a deeply believing Christian to be worried about this, because this is really about religion mm. on, on one level, but, mm. but on, on a much deeper level, it's about our culture and mm. fundamentally mm. our historical identity mm -hmm. as well. Mm. And, and, I th and I think that's the really important thing here. Yes. And there's a point that, I mean, obviously, as Rafe said, a lot of the numbers, the Christian numbers will be made up by Poles mm. and people who have African heritage. Mm. Um, but this is, 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 was one of the main concerns about the speed of mass migration, the mm. speed of change, mm. is that it would strip away so much of our, of our historical culture. Mm. Mm. Um, and that is clearly what has happened. And actually, so just before we move on to talking about um, what's been happening with Albanians, mm. um, so according to the census, only 81% of the population is now um, white British. Mm. And all the major cities, so Manchester, Birmingham, mm. um, and, and London, obviously, um, quite significantly less than half of the population are mm. white British. Well, actually, uh, only 74% of the nation is white British, 81% is white. Mm. So it's even greater mm -hmm. than that. And there's been that 20% decline, I think it's 20% or 10% decline in the last uh, 20 years. Mm. And London in particular, you know, in 2001, London was 59.7% mm. white British. It's now 36%. Mm. So it's gone in the space of 20 years from being the indigenous people, quite rightly, being the majority in the capital city to being just barely over one third of the population. I and I was trying to think of another mm. capital city in there modern history there there that has gone one. through such radical demographic shift mm. where the indigenous population is actually now a minority. I think it's quite unprecedented. And what happens as a, as a result of that is that London loses its collective memory, say that. its yeah. collective yeah. identity, mm. and its character. Mm. And, you know, if you go on the streets today and you stop somebody and, and ask them what the Blitz was or what the Great Fire yeah. of London was, mm. absolutely no registration. So does the city, is the city still the same city it was mm. when there's nothing that ties people to the collective memory that we have of this place? And if you don't have a collective memory, you don't have a sense of value either. You don't have a set of shared values that, that you can communicate to other people and that you can you can live, actually. Because if, if everybody are, are living in identitarian silos or racial silos, there isn't a sense, there is there really and isn't a sense of... Douglas, Douglas made a, a mm. good point on Twitter about this as well, that Douglas Murray, that, um, that some commentators, journalists have been saying things, you mentioned the, B, mentioned the BBC, saying things like, well, what's so objectionable so, about so this? What? What's so mm. objectionable about the white British population being so proportionally reduced? And the point that he made was, the, well, there's one obvious reason why this is objectionable, and it's that we didn't vote for it. Mm. And, and repeatedly, the British public have voted against it. In all the opinion polls, people have been against it. And th this is a problem with the, with the leadership. This is a problem with government that the, with, that the people have just been ignored. Yes, I think um, I think this is the one big issue, and I've always thought this that has actually contributed to the massive decline of trust in our whole system mm. is immigration mm. over a period of 30, 40 years. Total ignoring of people's views. More than that, actually demonization. That is that is without almost. Any other topic I can think of, that is the one. But when you said comment, sorry, but when you said commentators, there was like uh, Douglas pointed out, yes, true. Ha, not just commentators, I might add. Uh, former Home Secretaries, mm. uh, Sajid mm. Javid, uh, said, uh, I think Nigel Farage said about this, our cities, the stats. Um, they're now minority white, white, uh, British, and uh, Sajid Javid just said, so what? Well, mm. what do you mean, so what? I mean it. If you went to Mumbai and, and basically you said to Indian people in Mumbai, you know, do you know that half your city now is European white? Um, they would have something to say about it. 
They really would, and quite rightly, you know. But, but actually, not only them, people here, the white liberals here, oh, yes. would have something exactly. to say about it yes. as well. And that, that's, yes. the, that's the ludicrous aspect of But it's not, it. it's not even, I mean, the, the whole, t I mean, I see, I'm just looking at Twitter, you can see the accusation of racism being hurled around all over the place. But just simply to look at, as you were saying, Rafe, on, on so many of these different points, it doesn't matter which, which aspect of this you're looking at. What you're seeing over time is a trend of exceptionally rapid change mm -hmm. that is is moving society away from the, the way that it had been for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, towards a very different kind of society. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not racist to point out that the, the rapidity of that change has a very disruptive um, has very disruptive consequences for societies that call because these, these people are not numbers these are people who live in a place that they call home and those places are changing beyond recognition in a very very short period of time and so that's nothing to do with people's ethnicity so much as you know it's it's disruptive yeah. I knew I knew, I knew a very nice chap it was a Dr. Bernardo's child and lived his whole life at Leighton and he kept pigeons and everyone it was a wonderful guy uh, and knew, knew him for 20 years and he ended up being the only person left on his street who was white British. Yeah. Everybody else said, was white, actually. The entire street in his lifetime had changed. And so he upped and left as well because he said, I, we should know all the neighbours and we just no longer feel that this is our home any longer. Is that rapid demographic shift, you know, the North London lovies who are protesting about the Jewish settlements displacing Palestinians mm -hmm are completely silent about the fact that you've had the entire That's Cockney the population point, of East London on their own doorstep mm -hmm. displaced, right? Mm -hmm. If the Cock I said before, if the Cockneys were a tribe in the Amazon, you would have the UN sending in forces to try to protect their habitat, right? But it happens here in the urban jungle and nobody cares about it. And it's, and it's not racist to say that when people in a large number arrive somewhere, they form segregated communities. And if you go to Dubai, you'll see the English doing the same thing, or the Costa or del Spain. Sol, not speaking a word of <laughs> and, English. And it's human nature, it's not racist to acknowledge no, that. But and even, you know, they don't have to even have been here long enough to form communities. I, I, I think we're going to talk about maybe the Albanians yeah. next, and, and, and they've been here two minutes, and yet they're, they're putting their flag Thank up. Thank you because for the segue, Philip. Yeah, I <laughs> know, yeah, but I'm going to disrupt your segue. Damn it, say, you know, <laughs> it sounds like a sort of vaguely sexual act. <laughs> um, no, uh, I must say, say one thing, uh, again, referring to Twitter, but uh, sometimes the people who uh, would call you racist, they do reveal themselves mm. uh, by their own words. So like, we had George Monbiat today on Twitter. He's that famous uh, e eco-warrior, uh, George Moonblatt, I think mm. they call him, um, saying quite openly, he said, um, before immigration, I, I've never known anything so stifling as the white Christian village in which I grew up. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, I think we've said this before on this program, that showed you, not only is that actually rather racist to say, right because you're, you're talking about people's uh, skin color and, and religion and everything in that way but also it shows what they really think i it's not because they love migrants or they want to welcome migrants anything it's anything which somehow is going to destroy mm. or, or chip away mm. at the culture in which they grew up mm. which is in his case obviously a rather middle class you know nice one uh, it's like a detesting of that culture I think Peter Hitchens made this point. And it's, and and it's, it's, people, it's people like that, sorry, people like that will go on their gap year and say the most rewarding year of their life was living in an African village or an Indian village, mm. which was entirely homogenous as well, right? The irony there, the hypocrisy is obvious. And it's people, you know, posh people saying, oh, I don't like my own culture, but I'll, I'll, I'll use, you know, people of colour because yeah. they, they provide a little bit of colour. They're interesting. Mm. They're a diversion. Mm. And, and that mm. was essentially what mm. he was saying. Yes, know, exactly. Along with the gross racism and anti-whiteness. I mean, we, you know, we were with um, uh, Michael Collins, you know, yeah. uh, last night, who wrote that wonderful book, The, Bar uh, the Likes of Us. And, but in that he makes the point, you know, it became very clear around about 10, 15 years ago, you could go to these North London dinner, par dinner parties, or actually even in South East London now. And, you know, white, partial liberals would say things like, it's great around here, it is a bit white. Mm. Things like that, you know, you would, you'd hear that, oh, that's terrible. Mm. So you're quite right, it provides this exotic background, that's how they see things. Mm. Their actual interaction with other people from other nations is very, yes, it's paternalist. It's, it's very it's, small, know. it's very, very, if you want real integration, if you want integration or that mm. matters sort of intermarriage or, mm. or, or, or go to look the working class, that's mm. where it actually happens. Well, well now that London and 
Birmingham are minority white British, I would actually like to see uh, people, white British in those cities start applying for jobs that are exclusively reserved for ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, mm -hmm. if there are ethnic can minority candidates shortlists and job openings, I think it's high time that white British people actually applied for those jobs and, and see what happens because logically that's what they should do. Mm -hmm. But the more important thing here, and I think it's an adult conversation we need to have, is that when people come over from these cultures in such vast numbers, they keep their cultural practices. And we are mm. seeing an, a, a shocking rise in the big, big cities of things like acid attacks, mm. of honor killings. We're seeing the groups of kids with machetes now on the streets, mm. cultural practices we didn't see before, forced marriages, female genital mutilation. We know all about the, the rape gangs that exist in the north of England too. Uh, and there's even now the Metropolitan Police in London mm. now has a witchcraft training unit to train people to recognize yeah. because of the practices that are coming from Africa. Mm. This is the dark side of diversity, which we need to actually shed a light on. Um, okay, so wow, um, there's we're a segue not, from I don't, <laughs> which is no segue from that. Um, from rich witchcraft to um, Albanians, um, I think we're probably going to have to drop the welcome collection because we're not going to have enough time. Um, but let's let's oh, quickly talk about. You mentioned um, it now. Yeah. <laughs> People are going to be thinking. I'd already oh, mentioned oh, it in the introduction. About that. <laughs> or, 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 or why are they talking? Yeah. So yeah. let's let's talk about um, what's been going on with um, the Albanians celebrating Albanian Independence Day in London. Um, we have seen hugely disruptive scenes mm. of. Um, cars blocking roads, people getting out of their cars, being generally disruptive and waving their flags for Albanian Independence Day. And the whole thing, you know, fine if Albanians want to celebrate Albanian Independence Day, but it is a totally legitimate thing to ask why if this is the place that they've decided to call home, they would want to be so disruptive and actually so sort of obnoxious and disrespectful by, by causing this kind of chaos in central London um, in order to celebrate their independence well, day. I, I think the thing about it was, it was it's just so aggressive. But the other thing about it, which was really interesting, was when you, when you see it, you see the size of the cars, these great big expensive cars, and you think, hang on, they were coming over on, on, on boats mm. just a few weeks ago, and yet they've got Audis and Mercedes and, 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 and all of these kinds of things. So it's, it's just puzzling to see why they would be so antagonistic but they've never to a done culture that they, they, they want to come to and, and call home. We've never seen Albanian Independence Day celebrated in this no. way in London before. This is the no. first time that any this has ever been seen and it's obviously coming after we saw um, them putting up the Albanian flag on mm. Churchill's statue and things like that. Um, and all of the stuff about Albanians in the news. There's something about this particular sort of performance mm. that feels like it is in it's in intentionally obnoxious in some way, don't you think? Well, it's hegemonic, well, isn't it? Yes, in fact, actually, didn't they drape an Albanian flag across Churchill statue mm. uh, during Remembrance? Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, it won't be considered to be um, aggressive and disruptive um, to Londoners because Londoners have changed. Mm. Uh, and uh, they won't, uh, you know, they, they really won't take any objection to it, I'm sure. I think people are pretty annoyed at the disruption that no, it's No, no, the rest of the country, yes, will look on and say what's sort of going on. But I mean, basically, I think London's become this kind of, I don't know, it's a... Uh, and the most interesting thing, of course, is the fact that you've even had some London councils flying the Albanian flag. Mm. But of course, when St George's Day rolls around, mm. there's not a single St George's cross mm. that's to be seen. And I think that's one of the greatest scandals here. It, it goes all the way back to when I, I said at the time, Red Ken turns green, where he allowed a St Patrick's Day parade, mm. but he vetoed a St George's Day parade mm. through the capital city of England, quite quite astounding, and we know why there are so many Albanians because we've had what is it, two percent, ten ten percent or two percent of the entire nation has arrived <laughs> over in the last year. That's why you're seeing this, you know. And we accept fifty five percent or something, or over half of the applications we accept here, which is ten times as much, or more as than ten as times as much else. as any other yeah. country uh, applies for. Sweden has now passed a law stating that. Uh, Albania, Croatia and several other countries, Bosnia, are safe countries. Mm -hmm. So anybody who arrives from a safe country gets deported immediately. I don't know why here when we have Parliament as sovereign we can't do something similar. And just one more point to add on to that that, that people may already know but it's it's not just the, the 40 percent, it's, 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 it's a huge percentage of men under 40. Mm -hmm. It's like 2% mm -hmm. of the population. Mm -hmm. As I said before, it's almost like an army. Mm -hmm. And that's what they've done. It's, it's an invasion and they've put up their flag. If you, I just think if you wanted to come and peaceably make somewhere 
your home mm. and you wanted to get along with your neighbours, mm. you'd be considerate mm. to them. You wouldn't be blocking the roads and, and doing all this hoo-ha that we saw in the last couple of days. Yeah. Anyway, on that note, unfortunately, we didn't manage to make it to the Welcome Trust. Maybe we'll come back to it another week. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Rafe. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Peter. And we will see you next time on Newspeak. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as £3 per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember, to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.